The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Uh, Senator Sampson was elected to the New York State Senate in 1996. He represents the 19th Senate District, which encompasses a large portion of Southeast Brooklyn, including neighborhoods such as Canarsie, East Flatbush, and parts of Brownsville, Crown Heights, Midwood, and Kensington. John grew up in that neighborhood uh, that he represents and was educated at New York City public schools and universities. Leader Sampson, we're pleased to have you uh, chosen, Abney, to present the remarks about the various fiscal challenges faced by New York State. All New Yorkers have a stake in the future of our state, and everyone will have to be engaged in the process to find an equitable solution to this budget crisis that we face. We look forward to hearing from, your, from, from you on your perspective uh, and from uh, the Democratic Conference's vision for stabilizing our state uh, while creating protecting jobs for New Yorkers. Leadership in state government has never been more important than right now, and we look forward to hearing from you your blueprint for moving New York State forward. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New York State Senate Democrat Conference Leader John Sampson. Bill, before you uh, sit down, I want to uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, the members of Abney for having me here. I never knew your father, but Mr. Rudin, I know, was a great advocate for New York City. And Bill, you have continued his legacy with distinction, and I want to thank you very much. And let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the city and the state remain at a crossroads. There are no more easy choices. Politics must get out of the way of progress. We all know that governing New York can be tough, to say the least. And in my first year as leader, I have experienced it firsthand. But we've come a long way since 2008, when Democrats gained control of the New York State Senate for the first time in 44 years. Thank you. We understood the need for reform from the very beginning. The first thing we did was change the way business was done. We placed all legislative activities online in real time. We changed rules to give all legislators, and I mean all legislators, a voice in the process because they had no voice before. Because all constituents deserve to be heard. We passed the toughest ethics and campaign finance law in a generation to make sure everyone plays by the same set of rules. As you have all read, there have been some frustrating moments. Take, for instance, last year's coup was a distraction. But now the voters have spoken, and the senators behind that effort won't be returning to Albany. Just this month, I wrote an open letter. Thank you. <laughs> I'm quite sure I'd be happy about that. Just this month, I wrote an open letter to um, Mayor Koch, and in support of his New York uprising principles, I reaffirmed my intent to join with the next governor, Andrew Cuomo, in real ethics reform. The stage has been set for us to build on the work we have started to strengthen New York's economy, to ease the tax burden, and put more money in New Yorker's pocket. For example, Working closely with the Attorney General, we empowered local governments to consolidate services, thus reducing waste. We reformed the state pension system, saving billions, close to $48 billion over the next 30 years. We changed the way public authorities operate by creating oversight for the first time ever. Earlier this year, people said, we would never 
be a finalist for federal education funding. We doubled the charter school cap. We took the lead in passing Race to the Top. That helped us secure $700 million for education. A huge victory, a huge victory for all our children in the state of New York. These accomplishments often get lost in the noise of politics. New Yorkers are fed up with political games. They deserve policies that have a real impact on their lives. The economic crisis demands our full attention, but most of all, our action now. We are focused on job creation, economic innovation, and fundamentally, changing the business climate here in New York. Let's face it, New York City is managing to weather the recession better than upstate New York and in the suburbs. Those areas still confront enormous job losses in the manufacturing sector piled on top of years of economic neglect. Ladies and gentlemen, the question is, what did we do about it? What the Senate did was we extended and we expanded the Powerful Jobs Program. This supports more than 330,000 workers in places where manufacturing sectors have collapsed. We developed the first, the first in the nation green jobs program. It created 14,000 good paying construction jobs, lowered energy costs, and weatherized more than one million homes. We stopped irresponsible corporate giveaways where the state got little in return. Ladies and gentlemen, our economy has stabilized thanks in part to these measures, but it has not recovered. The growth we need to drive down unemployment just isn't there. That's why we have outlined an economic comprehensive plan to deal with these situations. It starts with new incentives to create new jobs, quality jobs that respect the rights and the needs of workers. We passed our Excelsior Jobs Program. This program offers significant investment and job creation incentives to high tech and high value industries. Now, I believe we need to expand it. We must also expand the Excelsior Real Property Tax Credit from five years to 10 years to stimulate long-term economic growth. Andrew Cuomo's Job Now Tax Credit is another big priority. This is an emergency two-year program that would encourage employers to hire unemployed New Yorkers, not yesterday, not tomorrow, but today. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't wait to send this tax credit to the Governor Cuomo's office for it to be signed into law. I look forward to working with the next administration to address the economic needs of different parts of the state. For example, the southern tier and the northern country. We have proposed a way to tap unused farmland for bioenergy production. By creating Biofuels Incentive Fund, we can help farmers grow their businesses while creating new energy supplies. Here in the city, there isn't a whole lot of farmland. But you know what? There are plenty of small businesses looking for help. And we have to be there for them to help them. As many of you know firsthand, access to capital is the lifeblood of any business. We want to double the small business revolving loan to help small business owners struggling with the credit crunch. We also are proposed legislation to start an entrepreneurial growth fund. It would provide grants to entrepreneurs 
who have the most innovative and promising business plans. We also need to encourage innovation and spur investment in New York's cutting edge firms. I support an angel investor's tax credit to provide 20% tax credit on capital investment. We also have to be smarter about our resources. We're spending too much and getting too little back. New York spends $4 billion at over 20 research centers, second in the country only to California. But still, we lag behind numerous states in turning that investment into jobs. We also have to do more, and I mean much more, to engage our world-class universities in economic development. We must foster partnerships that reward economic growth and job creation. Let's unleash the potential for applied research projects that bring together academic research and private sector know-how. Some of the nation's most successful, innovative, dynamic companies were born on college campuses. You've probably heard of one that started at Stanford. It's called Google. We need to create a statewide culture that fosters partnerships between universities, entrepreneurs, businesses, and investors. We need to have top-notch faculty help build pipelines to industry opportunities for campus researchers. To guarantee access to university resources and talents, the private sector should develop long-term agreement with state universities. We should adjust our tax policies for startups originating at these universities. We must look for new ways to provide access to capital to foster this growth. We need to strategically understand that we have to look at other sectors, such as the healthcare, such as life sciences, energy, nanotechnology, and agribusiness. Ladies and gentlemen, fortunately, we have a roadmap. SUNY Stony Brook is home to Long Island's high technology incubator. It supports high-tech businesses. Since 1992, it has contributed over $2.5 billion to the national economy. The College of Nanoscales, Science, and Engineering of the State University at Albany is the first in the world dedicated to nanoscience. With more than $6 billion in public and private investments, it has attracted over 250 global corporate partners. With the support of the state, CUNY is constructing a new advanced science research center on City College campuses that will support high-end research. Ladies and gentlemen, we have great success stories. But in order to move forward, we need to change the business climate. It is still to do, it is still too expensive to do business here. People are angry about that, and they should be. And I'm quite sure a lot of people in this room feel that way also. New programs need to create jobs are important. Investment incentives are critical. But we need to send a message to the business community. And that message is plain. That message is simple. And the message is, we get it. New York can run a smart, lean, efficient government in these tough economic times. I have no bigger priority than that. I sent that message loud and clear earlier this year when we blocked the passage of the hedge fund tax that would have sent jobs out of the state. We simply can't change the rules in the middle of the game if we want businesses to invest in New York because businesses are looking for stability a stable economic and political environment so they can invest their dollars. That is why fiscal responsibility is more than a priority. It's a necessity. Businesses need to have confidence 
Taxpayers deserve transparency and accountability. The struggling economy demands government efficiency, plain and simple. And a big chunk of that involves how we spend taxpayers' dollars. Just look at the numbers from 1998 to 2008. Spending doubled from $60 billion to $120 billion. Debt nearly doubled from $31 billion to $54 billion. The interest we pay on debt also doubled from $3 billion to $6 billion. That bill takes away from education, health care, and most of all, economic development. You know what? I'm proud to have reigned on the parade of fiscal negligence. Our budget this year kept spending under the rate of inflation for just the fourth time in 30 years. We also rejected new borrowing and budget gimmicks. That's why I support and I will pass the ravaged fiscal reforms that deal with gap budgeting and the independent budget office. Thank you. But ladies and gentlemen, because of our predecessor's fiscal recklessness, it's no wonder property taxes in New York are through the roof. 320% increase in Nassau County, a 550% increase in Suffolk County, the worst in the nation in Westchester County. Upstate communities continue to suffer from high taxes and great job loss. That's why we were fully committed to a local property tax cap. We're so committed, we passed that legislation tax cap not once, but we passed it twice. All we need is for the assembly to pass it once. I'm proud that we're getting a lot accomplished in this very difficult economic climate, but there is much more to do. Working with Governor Cuomo, that's right, Governor Cuomo, we're prepared to make tough choices, smart investments that new, all New Yorkers deserve. A lot of people wonder whether that's possible nowadays in government. And I understand their, frustra their frustration. And you know what? There is a good reason for them to have it. But there's also good reason for hope. Government can work effectively, transparently, responsibly, and productively. So ladies and gentlemen, I have a message to everyone and to New York. To the parents, we are serious about education. To the workers, we are serious about good jobs. To the taxpayers, all of us in this room, we are serious about fiscal responsibilities. To the business owners, we are serious about the economy. This is a time of great challenge, not for me, but for all of us. It's a good time and the best time for great leadership who understands that they have to be focused and determined to unite people irrespective of their party affiliation. And New Yorkers demand nothing less. To the people in this room and those across the state, this is our time to build a better New York in New York, that is truly the Empire State. And I look forward to working with all of you to make this happen. I want to thank you very much. Mr. Rudin, I want to thank you again for giving me this opportunity, and I want to thank Abby. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, and uh, we're, I think everybody is happy to hear uh, some of these initiatives that you're uh, going to undertake and all the things that have been accomplished. And uh, you know, we, we're, we're prepared to work with you and uh, uh, the new governor uh, and uh, the uh, speaker to make sure that New York 
keeps going in the right, uh, right direction. Uh, the senator has agreed to answer uh, a few questions, so please tell who you are and your affiliation, and uh, don't be shy. Good morning. I'm Simone Marie Meeks from the New York Academy of Medicine, and um, we are all concerned about our high cost of living. One of those high costs, high stresses on our economy is health care. And in the new uh, Health Care Reform Act, there's some $600 million for community prevention. And yet, uh, the Public Health Council that is in our state has on it representation from only hospitals. There is very, I believe there is one person representing public health. And I'm trying to understand how we intend to get to that money without the information that can be gathered from those working in public health. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a very interesting question, and, and, and that is something that we understand the importance of, of health care uh, on both fronts and on both ends. And I think this is what I've always talked about. It's about us working together to find a solution that can accommodate all parties. Because at the end of the day, we all need healthy New Yorkers because it's a less strain and stress that we have on our budgets and our systems, because if you look at it, healthcare and education comprise 60% of our $135 billion budget. We understand it, we get it, but that's why it's always great to work together with the industry and the public so we can find solutions, because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We want healthy New Yorkers, and we want to make sure that the quality, that they not only have quality, but they have access to full health care. You have in this room some leaders in healthcare, and I'm sure uh, there's been a constant dialogue between the, the leader's office and that's Ken Rasky from uh, uh, the Greater New York Healthcare Association. I saw somebody uh, who's going to raise their hand. Yes. How are you going to balance the budget next April without the billions of dollars in stimulus money uh, that the feds provided this year? You know, and, and that's very interesting, and that's why the first thing we need to do is we need to look at the, uh, the structural reform, stru structural fiscal reform that we need to take a look at, especially when we don't have the stimulus monies. Uh, we have to look again at government and seeing we have to reduce spending and make the necessary cuts. But most of all, we have to reach out to our partners in the public sectors, the unions, and the business people. We have to come to the table and figure out a way how we can deal with these deficits that we're going to be faced. It's not going to be next year. It's going to be the year after that. What we need to do is we need to put a structural plan in place that we can deal with this for the future. And this is what is so important about having a vision and working together with people on all fronts in order to get a solution to the problem. Because all of us will have to deal with this budget deficit, Republican, Democrat, independent. You know what? We need to come together, put a plan together, put the ne necessary fiscal uh, restraints and reforms into place, reach out to uh, the unions and let them know they have to share in to this also. So I think this is the, the dialogue uh, that we have started and we will continue to start because we, under we understand, and Senator Kruger would, would tell you, and she would agree that we understand about the financial plight that we face. And this is why we've been trying to put the necessary structural reforms in place now so we can deal with not only next year, but the year after that. It, 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 just a, a, a suggestion, uh, and Barry, I'll get you one second. Uh, we, had a, a, we had a small meeting with uh, Deputy Mayor Goldsmith, <clears throat> and most of the conversation was talked about using technology to deliver government services in a much more efficient and cost-effective way. You mentioned in your speech about utilizing the power of our state, which is our educational institutions. Uh, there is a revolution going on in terms of applications and technology, and we should be harnessing the power of the, particularly the young folks who are creating these apps and trying to apply it to uh, uh, government services. And you know, you do an RFP with you know the schools to create apps that will help you, whatever DMV to to prisons to everything in between. So. Uh, we suggest we're happy to help you point you in that right direction. My associate John Gilbert knows knows this stuff better than I do, uh, and there's a whole world out there uh, that that is ha uh, that can help you 
in your, in your goals. So uh, just a suggestion. One, one final question, anybody? Uh, Barry, go ahead. With regard to uh, gaming referendums, is there anything on your agenda with your, based upon uh, the, what I've heard is the need to have that kind of revenue in this state? Well, uh, just recently, I know that um, we, we just, uh, the proposal has been signed, uh, signed off by the controller with respect to um, operating uh, the Racino uh, at uh, Aqueduct. Uh, Senator Eric Adams, who's the chair of Racing and Wagering, uh, has been doing um, work on that, and we will continue to, to look down that avenue uh, because it is alternative uh, revenue, and this is something that we have to think about. We have to be creative, especially during this time where other revenue streams that we looked at and other revenue streams that we shouldn't even consider, like um, taxes, uh, we need to look at other revenue streams before we even think about raising taxes or even going down that avenue. Just one final comment. I think Senator Sampson, uh, when he talked about the hedge fund tax, he also forgot to mention that they didn't raise income tax this year. And so that, I think that was an important message, something that uh, we at Abney uh, uh, and other organizations uh, kept talking about to the leadership and how uh, detrimental to the economy that would be. And uh, we appreciate your uh, listening and understanding uh, you know, from the business perspective, what that what that meant. So we look forward to working with you, Senator, and thank you for coming this morning. A round of applause.